What's the difference between a good performance and a great performance? Don't accept any definition, any differential diagnosis that doesn't mean anything in terms of your own musical experience for the simple reason that outside your own musical experience, music just does not exist. Too many are the unmusical musicologists who invite you to think about music you've never experienced in the first place, nor for that matter have they. Well then, what is the difference between a great performance and a merely good one? You may know a piece inside out, may have played it yourself, but in a great performance you hear it for the first time. The experience is as simple, as paradoxical as that. Take the soloist's opening in the Beethoven Fiddle Concerto. You've been sympathizing with many a soloist during the unending orchestral exposition as he stood there nervously scared of those out-of-tune octaves with which he was eventually going to open his would-be brilliant proceedings. For let's face it, even when those octaves, those broken dominant sevenths, contrive to be in tune, they don't seem to mean all that much to him and to you. Or do they? That was Bronislav Hubermann, an original genius amongst virtuosos. Now, why do I call him that? Because of his inventive insight, which inevitably explores depths merely passive identifying insight can't reach. I must have heard him play the work at least a dozen times, and each time he made something strikingly different of those opening octaves. Only their continuity and indeed their urgency remained the same. Yes, that's a mark of great performance too. It's unique, not like a gramophone record of it, repeatable. Successive great performances of the same work have only their compelling logic in common, not the imaginative manner of its realization. For musical logic, as opposed to a conceptual syllogism, produces alternative inferences and conclusions. Take the conventional inference, which in the finale of the concerto, at the beginning of the transition, all our virtuosos draw when, almost monkey-like, their entry continues the repeated fifths from the tonic triads which have just been heard in the orchestra. As if repetitive continuation were all there was to the passage. But no, Beethoven lets the solo violin reuse the motif for the purpose of an intervention. The soloist picks up the motif in order to lead the argument elsewhere, and Hubermann's imagination enables him to realize an unsuspected dramatic juncture here. Instead of repeating, he quotes aggressively, and his reinterpretation of the motive lifts the argument on to a higher tensor level where it develops towards the second subject. <laughs> Thank you. 
You can hear the gypsy in him, can't you? He tended, I mean, he tended to explode in the finale's central episode. But the gypsy was only half the Huberman story. The other half was his sheer spirituality, which produced an unrivaled range of expression. Not for him the chronic vibrato of which masks intonation and expression alike. In fact, upon occasion at the end of the first movement's cadenza, he'd bring in the second subject totally senza vibrato, his right hand producing a breathtaking finely shaded, altogether dematerialized tone. Mind you, one never knew how he'd bring it in tonight. Let's hear him, and let's hear it right to the end of the movement, in order to experience the final triumphant climax with its rhythmic freedom, its crowning definition of the movement's tempo character. Mere meter, mere pace, meant nothing to Huberman. <laughs> 